You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we're joined today by Dr. Mike Amat of the Bradford University, Florida Gulf Coast University Serial Killer Research Database, here to talk to us all about serial killers. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here. Kristen, you make it sound so upbeat. (laughs) I I do. That's just a function of me being excited to be here and really geeking out over this amazing data analysis that I have at my fingertips as a result of this serial killer study. So yeah, I'm a little amped about serial killers. Maybe I need to tone it down just a bit. I'll try to dial it back. Let's let you jump right into it since you're so incredibly enthusiastic. (laughs) Mike, go ahead and start by talking to us about how this database originated. I know you said that it started as a classroom project. Tell us more. As an educator, I love that. I'm fascinated. So tell us all about the database and how it got started. Sure. So there was no intention of creating the database when it it first started, but I was teaching a course in forensic psychology at at Radford University, and the students were really interested, even back then, this is the uh, early 90s, even in serial murder. But what I found was that there really weren't very many good sources of information. There were a lot of true crime books, but there really weren't any good academic sources. There was, a, there was a profile that the FBI had put out about serial killers. You had a lot of people speculating, but there really wasn't good data. So what I did was I had my students do a, a serial killer timeline. So put them into groups of about three or four students, gave them a true crime book on a serial killer, and told them basically to create a timeline from when that uh, serial killer was born all the way through until they died or were convicted, and then to compare what their timeline and what their uh, research is showing, how it compares to what we talked about in terms of aggression in the classroom. And so we started off with a few of those, and I took them and threw them in the filing cabinet. And then I started looking through my filing cabinet and realized, I've got a lot of timelines. So I just stuck them into an Excel sheet. And it might not even have been Excel back then. I can't remember what the order was, but I think maybe Excel wasn't even ready then. Just started putting them in there, and then students wanted to know if they could do independent studies to start doing more research. And it just kept building and building. And then it got out to our local news media that we had this database, and they were so interested in it, we thought, let's make it a little more formal, and it's just kept growing. So did it change format over time as the data was entered by you and the students? How did it all come together? It changed in that we removed some fields, and we added quite a few fields. And then when the FBI changed the definition from three murders to two, we had to go back and collect the people that we had thrown out because they had only the the two murders. But we keep adding fields and we add a field, we have to go back and start filling in the, the thousands that we hadn't looked for that piece of information for. I'll ask the question that I think a lot of lay people who are not interested in true crime and serial killers might ask, what is the end goal of having a serial killer database? That goal's changed a little bit. So when I first started, it was really more to just give me good statistics to use while I teach my class. And then it became, let's go ahead and try to see if we can get great statistics for everybody to use on serial murder. And then the goal became, in addition to that, let's see if we can find some ways to maybe help law enforcement be able to find or profile serial killers. And then we got rid of that goal because it didn't look like that was going to be very successful for a number of reasons. So I think the goal right now is just compiling the, the most accurate data that's available so we don't really have some of these misunderstandings about, about serial killers. So how many subjects are currently in the database, Mike? What do we, what's the universe of people we're looking at? So overall, we have just short of 5,800 serial killers in there. Most of them, 3,700 are from the U.S., and about 2,100 are international. That's a scary number. 
It is. And we've uh, created a kind of a second database where we're looking at, instead of just the serial killers, we're looking at their victims. And so that's limited for the most part to the U.S. and Canadian victims. But I'll tell you, that was a huge change in our uh, our database because what we realized is breaking, really basically saying we, we need to see each victim name for each serial killer really made the database more accurate because we, we had people listed as, for example, having killed six. You go through and try to find out who those six are, and you realize there were only two, but somewhere along the way, somebody in law enforcement had said, it wouldn't surprise me if they've killed six. And you mm-hmm. realize, yeah, that's not proof. <laughs> it's not the same thing at all. No. <laughs> One thing before we move past these numbers, is it significant to you that there are 3,700 serial killers in the database for the United States and 2,100 internationally? Is that a matter of data access or does the u.s have more serial killers on a per capita basis than every other country on the planet my take on this and and not everybody agrees with this take but my take on it it's it's a matter of access because if you look at murder rates by country the u.s falls about in the middle and so it doesn't make any sense that we would be about in the middle in terms of murder rates but number one by so much in terms of serial killers, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But then if you think about um, how people get into the database, they had to, somebody had to have killed two or more people on two or more occasions. That had to be discovered. It had to be reported someplace. It had to be reported someplace in English because that's uh, pretty much the, the only uh, language I speak and I barely speak that. <laughs> and uh, so I think the thing is, it's just so much easier to get information about U.S. serial killers than it is others. To give you a good example of that, years ago, there was a master student out in California, and I can't remember the name of the university, but she was from Japan, so she spoke uh, fluent Japanese, and she did her thesis on Japanese serial killers, and her thesis found so many serial killers that nobody had ever reported before, but the difference was she spoke the language, she could look at the Japanese newspapers and media sources and find things nobody else could. So even though it's a boring answer, it's a matter of it's more a matter of access than it is something about the U.S. Um, I think that's really the the explanation for it, and that's why I think when you interpret serial killer data in general, you just really have to be careful about how you interpret things because so much of it is access. What is your methodology for this in terms of data collection? What are the metrics that you're looking at? How do you get all your data and who is doing the the data entry? Hopefully this doesn't all fall to you. It does for the most part these days. Uh, okay. um, but over the, over the years, it was mostly my students creating the, the data. I started to put it in the database. But again, as students wanted to do independent studies, they would start to enter, enter the, uh, the data. I retired from teaching about 15 years ago. I'm a full-time consultant with, with a consulting firm out of DC, and so I don't have the access to the students that, that, that I used to. When we first started the database, the internet really didn't exist. And so pretty much it was a matter of looking at true crime books, and there's such a difference in terms of accuracy of those books. There are some really mm-hmm. good true crime writers, and there are some horrible ones. One of my students got confused because the book she had, they listed three different birth dates for the killer in the same book. And that's not, that's not a really a good, it doesn't have, give you much confidence in the, in the accuracy of the, of the book. But then the students would go into the library and look at microfiche and microfilm and uh, looking at major newspapers like the New York Times. But then as the internet came about, it started changing everything. And if you you think about today, we go through and we still look at true crime books. We look at different media sources. But for example, Ancestry.com has been a phenomenal source in terms of getting birth dates and death dates and race information and family information, whether they served in the military. Newspapers.com is again one of those, we get these from these small towns, we get access to all these different uh, newspapers. So the methods has, t- has changed in a little bit, but what we try to do is make sure we have at least a couple of sources that are going to say the same thing. For example, if we have the date of a particular murder, we want to find a couple of sources uh, or for the uh, birth dates, same type of situation. Everything we have in the database is from public information. So we don't have any secret access, let's say, to the FBI files. We don't have psychiatrist reports that weren't part of the court proceeding. And we have done that on purpose because we want to share our database with um, other researchers. And if we had access to data that was private, 
it would limit our ability to share that. So everything we have now is something that anybody could get if you want to spend thousands and thousands of hours getting it. <laughs> it sounds like you miss your students in that regard. Oh, I do. I miss teaching a, a quite a bit, but I just had, they were offering a early retirement option. The state was, and this consulting firm has wanted, they had wanted me to come on board full time. It was a tough decision, but uh, I'm glad I made it, but I really miss teaching being in, uh, with my students. How often do you add new information to the database? Is this a, a weekly thing, a daily thing, monthly? It's, a, it's at least a weekly thing. So at least yeah. once a week, I'll go in and, and search to see if there are new serial killers that have been identified. Or if, for example, from an old case, there's new information that came out. For example, that with, with the DNA technology now, to beginning to identify victims that we had to be listed as unknown in the past. And so those are the kinds of things we update, but, it's, but it really it's a weekly process. When I had called you, I, th I think it was last week, to ask if you wanted to appear my on Mind Over Murder, and I had mentioned the Alan Wade Wilmer Sr. You had said, oh, yeah, we already have him in the database. So, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's fast work. That's great, because it's, it's really only been since January 8th that they made that announcement that he is good for the murders of Robin Edwards, David Noblin, and Teresa Howell, which does make him a serial killer. So yeah, absolutely. How does Wilmer move on to your database so quickly in this example? Again, just going through media sources, it popped up in, in the headlines. And so I add his name, go through and verify that, in fact, that the three people he was suspected of killing, there's a reasonable suspicion for that. Mm -hmm. you, you get a lot of ones of people that you can't really put in because they suspect, but there's not really enough evidence to to suggest that they did it. But, but right away, the name goes in. I, I spend some time trying to find whatever information I, I can find at them and then mark them down as a follow-up because there'll be other information that, that comes out. But he's one of those, for example, that could go to Ancestry.com, get the birth date information, get the death information, get all that stuff that it wouldn't be in a newspaper article, for example, or a media source, but is available. As soon as we knew about him, which is a few months ago before the announcement, we had done all that basic research with using Ancestry and newspapers.com and other sources. So we had a pretty decent address history, date of birth, marriage, divorce, when his kids were born, that, that sort of thing. So we had a sense of that. We're just pleasantly surprised that as a newly minted serial killer, which by the way is an expression we're comfortable using because according to, as you said, according to the FBI's criteria, Alan Wade Wilmer Sr. meets their criteria. Interestingly, the FBI so far, and it's only been a month, they never call him a serial killer. They seem to avoid terms like that quite often. They do, and the, I think that the FBI's boxed themselves into a corner with their definition. Because if you think about two or more murders on separate occasions, uh, think about somebody who's a contract killer. They certainly fit the definition of a serial killer. So as we find them, we'll put them in our database. We don't go searching for the contract killers, but they would be in there. But those are certainly different types of people than somebody that is killing homeless folks on the street. The, the kind of the term I like to use instead of serial killer is multiple event killer. Mm -hmm. And then I think a serial killer is going to be a subdivision of that because when that term first came out, it was coined to, to describe people who killed in a series. And most of these multiple event killers, again, they, they fit the definition of the FBI serial killer, but they're not killing in a series. They might kill three people over a 30-year period because they're angry, or they kill people over a period of time because they're robbing banks but they're different. They're not that serial killer. And that's one of the things that I think that we're going to try to do at some point is see if we can subdivide serial killers into different types. We already have started that, but we haven't done any analysis on that. And I think we're going to see some real differences in these kind of these subtypes. For example, a person who is killing women and sexually assaulting women is going to be very different from the person who was killing people at 7-Eleven. They're still, they're going to be serial killers, but they're not the same type of serial killer. Mm -hmm. And I think once that research really starts, again, we're already doing the categorization of those. I think we're going to see some really different results, different patterns. So are you thinking you're going to end up with several different subcategories? Yes. However many that is, I'm not sure whether it's going to be something like 10 or 20. I'm not sure. But I think one of the reasons the profiling has not been very successful is because all serial killers aren't the same. Mm -hmm. But it could be that if you look at a certain 
type or subtype that maybe they share a lot more in common and that profile can be much more accurate because the current profile is certainly not, not very accurate. I was taking a look at the landing page for this study, and it states that you utilize over 185 data points, multiple murder methodology, victimology, and statistical analysis. Can you talk about those 185 data points that you look at? Sure, but to save your audience a lot of listening, um, let me put it into categories. Perfect. That'd be great. Yes. So we start off with the actual murders themselves in terms of when when they began and when they ended what cities they occurred in, what counties, what countries. We then go to a series of columns that describe childhood. So when they were born, where they were born, who were they raised by, did they have problems in school, what type of education did they have at the time of the the first murder. Then go into information about the person themselves in terms of were they abused as a a child, did they have the the triad, did they abuse uh, drugs or alcohol. Can you explain the triad? I'm sorry for those of of our listeners who are not criminologists. So the McDonald's triad basically postulates that people who were aggressive had three common experiences. They were having bedwetting uh, past the age at which you would expect uh, bedwetting. They were they were setting fires, and there was animal abuse. And so that was pretty exciting when the, when it first came out. But like anything, people thought that meant everybody that's a killer has those characteristics. Mm-hmm. And if you have those characteristics, you're going to be a killer. And what it turns out is that most serial killers and most murders don't have those characteristics. They might have one, but they're not going to have all three. And there are plenty of people who have those that don't become murderers. But if you look at the kind of the probability, those that have all three characteristics are probably more likely to become violent than those that don't. But it's not strong enough that you can predict uh, with those. But if they have those three characteristics, regardless of whether they're going to be uh, violent in the future, it's problematic in terms of they're going through psychological trauma. So it's not one of those things that you ignore, but you you don't instantly uh, assume that they're going to become a killer. Very interesting. So murders, childhood, emotional factors, any, uh, so those are the three main categories. Were there any others that you take a look at? Sure. And then we we go ahead and look at the the murders themselves in terms of uh, how they were committed. Whether, for example, there was something such as necrophilia that, that, that occurred, um, what type of weapon was used, who were their victims. And then it goes into the outcome of when they were arrested, how many murders were they charged for, did they confess, did they plead insanity. So it goes through pretty much every part of their life and every part of kind of the, the murder series. Now, we, I would love to say we have every bit of that information for every killer, mm-hmm. but we don't. Yeah. There, there are, are some things, for example, like race and gender that we have information on for everybody. But then things like where they were abused as children, we might have information on, let's say, 20% um, with that. And that's a good example, by the way, of uh, with the child abuse of a, of a difficult variable. Because if you're reading uh, the trial transcripts, if the person was abused as a child, it's going to show up most likely in the sentencing part of the, the trial. But if they weren't abused, it's not really going to be mentioned. So you, when you see that lack of it being mentioned, you don't know if that's a no mm-hmm. or just we don't know. And so you have to just be, and so we limit uh, our entries to ones that we know. And most of the ones, we, it just isn't mentioned anywhere. And then you have to be careful too, for example, like with uh, Arthur Shawcross, who was the uh, Genesee River killer. He, he told all these stories about being abused as a child. That when they interviewed his parents, of course, his parents said didn't happen. When they interviewed some relatives, they said some of it happened and some of it didn't. And that's what you deal with a lot. And, and so you have to make some judgment calls on who, we be, who are we believing here. And, mm-hmm. and we've changed several of those codes or ratings over the years where we realize what we thought 20 years ago, there's evidence now to suggest either it did or didn't happen. This is pretty data intensive. How long is each entry? If it's complete, does it go on for page after page? Oh, no, it's an Excel spreadsheet. So every serial killer will have one row in the database, and then they'll have hopefully entries in most of the columns. And you can add more data as it becomes available. So if you learn new things from an interview or a court transcript or a well-researched book, you may add additional data points as you go along? Oh, absolutely. Yep. And then we have, and this is where it's probably going to get start sounding boring, but in, in the same file as the rest of the database, we have separate tabs that will automatically calculate 
all the, the data, Kristen, that you were looking at in the okay. report, it's going to automatically update those every time we add uh, some new data. So wow. it makes it makes it easier to to summarize. And it's it is fascinating. What what we'll do is we'll put a link to your most recent annual report into the show notes so that people can take a look at it, or that the most recent one that people have access to. I know it's not all uh, publicly available. It was just fascinating sitting there and combing through that because it is it is just so much interesting data to take a look at. So how did the partnership with Florida Gulf Coast University come about? Because this was originally, it started at Radford. How did that partnership come about? It was really interesting. There was a uh, grad student at Florida Gulf Coast uh, University, uh, Kristen Elink Sherman Laura, <laughs> so a long name, but she um, was requested access to the database to work on her, her thesis. She was looking at, if I'm remembering right, it was the relationship between military service and, and uh, uh, serial murder. And she got the idea that it would be great to put this thing online where people could go in and have access to it. And I thought, maybe... And so uh, they brought me down to Florida Gulf Coast and um, did a, got to meet all their students, and uh, they were really charged up about doing this. So I said, let's do it. Dwayne Daubert was the faculty advisor at the, at the time. And so they took the database, they went through, and they tried to confirm every entry in it. <laughs> and so we went back and forth about whether the, if they found something wrong, whether I thought it was actually wrong or not, or whether the, like, their source was wrong. So that went back and forth. And then they put that online and uh, people can try to get access it. Now, the online version is way behind. It's, that's not, hasn't been updated. And we're working right now with Florida Gulf Coast to, uh, to try to update something. And we're actually starting a new partnership with uh, Norwich University in Vermont. And they've got some just really smart faculty and, and smart people there that Elizabeth Gurian and Rachel Sickler that are going to take it to the next level. So right now we're going to be um, working with them and, and Florida Gulf Coast to try to, to bring this to the kind of the modern times as opposed to my, my spreadsheet. <laughs> Is there such a thing as a typical user? Like what are some of the examples of things that people might do with the information in the database? So the typical user is either going to be a college professor or a grad student working on, for example, a thesis or a dissertation that has a particular question in mind that they're trying to answer. So we'll provide the database to, to them and they will use what we have, but uh, also add new information. For example, if they're going to only be concentrated on one thing, for example, th that uh, they can maybe find things that we didn't because we're concentrating on so many different variables, and then we can add that to the, to the database as well. We've had a few folks in law enforcement that have, have asked for it. We thought it would actually, we'd get many more requests from law enforcement, but, but we haven't. Is that because people don't know about it or because they don't see how they can immediately relate that to the work that they're doing? That's a good question. I think it's probably a mixture of both. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. So when you hear about a new serial killer like Alan Wade Wilmer Sr., we talked a little bit about just some of the basic data that you can put into the database for them. So date of birth, so on and so forth. What other sort of information are you looking for when you add a new killer to the database? Would it benefit you, for example, to talk to an investigator that's worked on the case? It would as long as it was data that we can publish. Again, so if, if we talk to, uh, to an investigator who says, now, this is off the record, but that's not going to help us because we have to have things that, that are, are, are publicly uh, uh, available. Where I think it comes in handy uh, or where information could be helpful is when we added the victim section, we added a lot of columns involving what went on at the actual murder site. For example, was a person bound? Was there torture? Was there overkill? And that can be really difficult information to get but that some of that information is still very public. It's just maybe something we haven't come across. And so that's the type of information that would be helpful. A lot of that's just not available because they hold it back. Or if there's not enough for a, a, tri for a trial, if there's not really an appeals, it doesn't show up very easily to, to be able to re read that. You'd have to be able to go get the original documents. And that, that's more work than even I'm willing to spend. <laughs> Is there a difference in what you feel you can put into the public record depending on whether or not a serial killer is alive or dead? 
for example, Alan Wade Wilmer Sr. died in 2017. The FBI and the Hampton, Virginia Police Department have confirmed through DNA that he's responsible for the murder of at least three people, and they're looking into more. Kristen and I aren't terribly shy about using his name publicly and saying he's involved in these murders. Whereas if someone's alive, maybe they're incarcerated, but are you as comfortable sharing data about their crimes? I am, but the and the reason I am is because we have a column where we will label the person as, for example, serial suspected, serial accused. Mm-hmm. And so various researchers, for example, have made the decision they're only going to use those that uh, have been convicted in, in their study. Then it, it, being accused or being suspected is not going to be enough. With that kind of hedge, we we feel a little bit more comfortable. Where we're very careful and don't release to very many researchers um, is our victim data. Because it might be, for example, that a particular victim was uh, a prostitute. At least that's what the police labeled that person or the media labeled that person. And we've had instances where uh, uh, people said, I see in their database that so-and-so would kill prostitutes. Well, he killed my daughter and she wasn't a prostitute. Uh And I go back and look at the individual victims. And that's exactly right. Let's say eight of the nine were prostitutes that the one person actually wasn't. But when when you're trying to define what's that person's basic motive or who are they killing, it was prostitutes. So I'm really gun shy about sharing victim data. For example, that would never go to a grad student. That would have to be to a, an academic that we trusted and that agreed to, to be very careful. And if you have, we have several people that we are close with in the community who have survived serial killers. If someone has survived an attack by a serial killer, do they go into the victim database or is there like a whole separate set of data to go with that? Well, that's a great question. Right now, the, we, the only victims we have are ones that were killed. For uh, a serial killer, we might list them as, for example, two murders plus attempts. So okay. it may be that they had uh, th- three unsuccessful attempts. And uh, we think that's important because, again, we find researchers don't feel comfortable with the FBI two or more. They want to maybe go three or four. And so they can then decide, is two murders and two attempts enough for them to do that? I want to get into some of the nitty gritty questions that I came up with as I was doing my deep dive into the data analysis here. So I'll I'll start with something kind of general and then we'll move into more specifics. What were some of the most interesting or surprising pieces of data that really stood out to you as you went and started combing over the database? I think the biggest surprise, this is one I've mentioned previously, is that there's so many types of serial killers. We got just that one term. I wasn't expecting to see that because when we started the database, that term was, you, you conjure up like a Ted Bundy, that, that all of these serial killers we find are going to be Ted Bundy. They're not. <laughs> and so that was the, the biggest surprise. And the thing I think that's complicated, again, some of the data analysis the most is until we really get these types figured out, these subtypes, we're, we're not going to make as much progress as we wanted. Uh, Another thing I found that was surprising was how inaccurate that kind of common profile was. So the common profile is that it's a serial killer was it's a white male in their mid to late 20s. So that profile, if if you look, say, since 1990, it's 7% fit that profile. That's not a pro- much of a profile when it's 7%. No. Uh, and, uh, and far uh, from that. a general category that would fit most of the crimes committed. Yeah, so that's one of, and one of the reasons I think that's particularly important is that you get somebody who might be, for example, 55 years old and is black, and people would say that can't be one of our suspects because they don't fit the profile. Nobody fits your profile, so you have to be careful about about that. Another thing that I found really interesting was that there's a thought that or stereotype that serial killers are going to have a, a certain type of victim. So I'm yeah. only going to kill women. I'm only going to kill mm-hmm. somebody of a certain race or age. Turns out that only 37% of serial killers kill people that are the same sex, the same race, the same age. And so, again, if you're law enforcement and you're trying to determine, trying to link different murders, and you say, couldn't be this, this person couldn't be linked because they were shot as opposed to stabbed, or this was a male and most of the victims are women. It turns out that's that, that linkage is just not there. And I think when you talk to Thomas Hargrave, you probably found this. He probably told you some of the same things. The linkage is a very difficult thing to to, to do. I was pushing back on this issue today regarding discussions in our social media pages on the Colonial Parkway murders. People are looking for patterns, which may or may not be there. But for example, I've got several people, and these are well-meaning 
folks who are supporters of ours and are interested in these cases. But for instance, I've got uh, several people insisting, oh, it's very clear that Wilmer likes dark-haired women. Yes, there are some victims with dark hair, but in the mix, there's some blondes and redheads too. And he has killed both women and men, and he's killed at least one single woman and at least one straight couple. And he's suspected of killing a lesbian couple, my sister and her girlfriend. Now, that hasn't been proven yet, but my point is, boy, everybody wants to say this particular killer kills this particular kind of person in this way, and both Kristen and I are trying to respectfully push back on that because the profilers that we've met with, and we've learned a lot, and they're fascinating people. Oh my gosh, yeah. It's been so interesting for us to have opportunities to sit down with these folks, both on and off the air. They're saying the same thing that you are, Mike, which is that we can't keep insisting that serial killers kill the same type of victim in the same type of way under the same circumstances. That just doesn't seem to be anything close to the way profilers in 2024 are seeing things. I agree completely. And and that's the problem, though, when you have something that was published, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, it it doesn't go away. (laughs) It it, it just keeps, it it hangs on regardless of what the kind of the current facts are. Mike, something else that I found very interesting, and I'm wondering if some of this question can be answered by the idea that maybe there just wasn't enough reporting going on during these decades. There is a massive jump in the number of serial killers between 1950 and 1980. You went from 90 active serial killers in 1950 to 60 to 251 to 670 to 823 in 1980. Is that a reporting issue or were there really just a massive jump in the number of serial killers in this country in those decades? I think a big part of it's uh, a reporting issue. Okay. So the term serial killer was coined, depends on who you believe, but it was coined in, for the most part, in the 1970s. So if you're doing a search for serial, like using the term serial killer, it's, you're not going to pop up for, with something in the 1950s or 60s. So you have to look for headlines that might be killed two, killed three. And so you, we, we must meticulously go through and use all those kind of combinations to try to find those. Now, it makes sense that Serial killers means would rise um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s because the interstate system. There's more access to the country, and if you, if they're killing in different states, it's more difficult to, uh, to perhaps to be to be identified and caught. But I think so much of it is is a reporting issue. That definitely makes sense. I'm writing that down about the interstate system because that is not something that I had previously thought of. It is interesting to think about the ways that the country was changing during those time periods that might lead to those numbers changing. I'm I'm making sure I'm putting that down. I guess in the same sort of vein, why is it that the numbers of serial killers have trended steadily downward since 1980? Is that because law enforcement is getting better at tracking them and solving cases? Is it just that maybe serial killers are getting a little tired and taking a break and going into retirement? (laughs) I think there's several things that are, that, are, that are going on there. One is certainly the law enforcement's gotten better in terms of things like DNA, being able to link murders. So that's certainly part of it. Technology, though, I think is another one of those things that has changed. For example, if you think about serial killers that are uh, black widows, so those are predominantly women who kill spouses for, usually for money, but there are other reasons as well. If you go back to, for example, 1920 or 1930, somebody could kill a spouse, move to another state, kill a spouse, still get the insurance money. Where today, all these computers, are the, the databases are linked. It would be very difficult to try to get insurance on a third spouse that was uh, <laughs> uh, mysteriously killed. So I think the, the technology's there. When you think about hospitals, uh, serial killers who kill their patients, the software is out there now that uh, you have expected death rates for every type of illness. And when those death rates exceed a certain level, it's flagged. So those are some of the reasons. I think there's really two main reasons that are are responsible for this decline. One is change in parole. If you look at the 70s and 80s, for example, where the serial killer rates were highest, there was a lot of pressure to parole people. The prisons were overcrowded. There was kind of movement toward prison reform. So we were releasing people then that would maybe become serial killers. An interesting fact is that in our database, 18% of the serial killers in our database had killed, gone to prison, and been released. 
And so if you are more strict on parole, um, I think that's one of the reasons which people, which uh, we are these days. Um, I think that is one of the, uh, uh, the expl- explanations. And the other one is there's, there are just fewer high risk behaviors that people engage in today. So when I think about when I was growing up, I rode my bike everywhere. Right. I hitchhiked. I right. picked up hitchhikers. I walked to elementary school. <laughs> Today, w- there are no parents that are going to let you do that. There are very few people who would hitchhike up hitchhikers. And so we did an analysis of comparing in the 70s and 80s, the percentage of murders that were uh, serial killers, serial murders that were of uh, high risk behavior, such as hitchhiking and, and helping people with stranded motorists with the ones from the last uh, two decades. And there's such a drop. It's a huge drop. And when you think about cell phones, 30 years ago, if you if your car broke down, you'd either have to get in a car with somebody or have them go to the gas station to use a payphone. Now you're not going to let anybody in your car. You're not going to get in their car. You're going to use your cell phone and call for help. And so I think a lot of those high risk behaviors have have changed. A few days ago, my partner Pamela and I were driving along a country road, and there was a pickup truck parked next to the road on this kind of straight, quiet stretch. The hazards weren't on, and we didn't see anybody in the vehicle. But then a couple hundred yards down the road, and this is wintertime, snowy and cold, there's a woman walking along the road. We stopped. I tried to let Pamela be visible so she leaned forward, but we just stopped briefly to ask if the, the woman was all right. And she smiled and said she was, and it looked like she was actually out for a walk. And I'm not even sure that was her truck necessarily. She told us she was fine and she was just out for a a walk on a beautiful winter day. We just wanted to make certain that she wasn't out there in the boonies without a cell phone or whatever. So she smiled and she seemed accepting of the fact that we'd made this offer of assistance. In listening to you just now, Mike, I'm thinking maybe that's increasingly rare. I think it is. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have enough information yet to draw any conclusions on how the pandemic affected the number and type of serial killers? I realize we're really barely out of the pandemic. Has there been any information that you can glean about how that affected serial killers and their activities? Not at this point. One reason would be is that there have not really been a lot of serial murders over the last few years, which is a good thing, um, but it's a bad thing for data. So it would be difficult to do that. There's a a lag period really between oftentimes the the serial killings and then when they're arrested and whether it gets announced. So I would say it'll be at least a decade before we could start to address that question. Oh, wow. Okay. That does make sense though. Absolutely. Do you feel like the advances in forensic technology and many of the things we've talked about over the last few minutes have discouraged people who might have exhibited these behaviors in the past? That's a great question. And I've had those conversations with with colleagues. And my, my initial response to you is, I don't know, because it can go both ways, right? It can be, now that I know what these advances in forensics are, I'm going to avoid leaving fingerprints. I'm going to avoid uh, leaving DNA behind. So it could be to encourage some that think that they can avoid it. Or for some of them, it may be they're going to catch me, so I'm not going to do it. And that would depend, I think, on, the again, like the subtype of serial killer, because there are going to be some killers that they have a need to kill, and they're going to, they're going to probably kill no matter what. But I think some of these ones that maybe kill for financial gain, that may have slowed that pace down a little bit. Just occurred to me when you were talking earlier about subdividing different types of killers, are you eventually going to have a different database for mass shooters and spree shooters? Is that going to become a whole separate database or are they just going to exist on the serial killer database? Yeah, they don't exist. The mass killers don't exist in our database. Oh, they don't. Okay. They don't. And I know that there are several researchers that have developed databases on mass killers. And so that, I think that's well taken care of by some, some other folks. The one that was more difficult were spree killers, because it, again, what the FBI basically said that they don't really distinguish between serial and spree in terms of the motives and those types of things. And so we will include those, but label them as within our database as spree. And again, researchers can make their own decision about whether they want to include them or not. So one of the things we've tried to do is be overly inclusive. And then let researchers who use the database make their decisions about who stays and who goes and whether they have to have a certain type of motive or not. Do you know if any serial killers who are currently incarcerated have ever been permitted to access the database? 
I know that there are people that are currently incarcerated that do have internet access that actually have made use of their time, but I didn't know if they ever had looked themselves or other people up in the database. To have access, they would have had to make a formal request. And if we saw, for example, that the it was coming from a prison, it would be declined. But it doesn't mean that, again, that they don't can't get somebody else to request it for, for them. I've noticed that I've had several requests from students where I've said, yeah, we'll, we'll give you this part of the database. Here's the conditions. So you need to agree to those and please copy your advisor on the on the email. And that way I can look up the advisor and make sure they exist. I've had several times where the student didn't get back and I thought, yeah, it's because it's not for a class project. That must mean you have people trying to access the database just for, I'm interested in serial killers, but not in an academic way. What we do, and the one where I struggle with now is I get requests from students who are in data science programs. Mm -hmm. So they need a database to to be able to do a class project for data science. And they think serial killers are interesting, but they're not really trying to study serial killers. And so in those situations, I'll usually ask them, what fields do you want? And give them maybe a a smaller number of fields. We don't give them the whole thing. And then I don't give them the names of the serial killers. So that way they can run their data and not worry about privacy aspects. Mike, what can we do to help you with data on Alan Wade Wilmer Sr. so that we can round out his entry in your database? We want to give you as much help as possible because obviously we have a vested interest in his activities. So tell us how we can help you. We would love to be able to. That's I, And I appreciate that. Probably the easiest thing would be if I sent you both the, the victim and the serial killer data that we already have have you take a look to see if there are fields that you can fill in that that I have blank. And that would be great. Perfect. We would love to be able to help in any way we can on that. How long do you see yourself continuing to do work on the database? Is this just going to be an all the time thing or is this your baby and you're invested in it? It's my baby and I'm invested in it. Um, So I'll I'll, I'll continue to do it. But I think that's why the uh, kind of the relationships or the partnerships with Florida Gulf Coast and Norwich are important because they can take it to a different level. So um, I'm going to still work on it because it's fun. It's like being a little detective and it's terrible when you get excited because you found a birth date, Uh, but (laughs) but it makes my day. And so I'll I'll continue to do that even after I retire. But I think that, again, with those two universities, they're going to take it to that next level. Dr. Mike Amat, formerly of Radford University, the inventor, shall I say, of the Radford University, Florida Gulf Coast University, Serial Killer Research Database. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today and lending us your considerable expertise. We appreciate it. Oh, I enjoyed it. It was great to meet both of you. Thank you so much. That is going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.